Thank you, Bill. I decided to tone down the lecture a little, title a little bit from tendon ruptures to tendon tears, so uh, one financial disclosure. So next few minutes, we're going to be talking about uh, tendon tears. Uh, I wanted to start out with a little, few anatomic considerations, since it's good to know the anatomy and how to scan uh, tendons and, uh, and look at what normal and abnormal look like. Okay. It's important to recognize that uh, tendons are really a, a very densely packed hierarchy of uh, collagen, starting from basic elements of collagen fibrils surrounded by ground substance. And then you see this hierarchy of tendon fibers and fas subfascicles at the various levels, ultimately to be condensed into a very f uh, uh, highly uh, densely packed uh, collinear structure surrounded ultimately by a synovial line sheath or uh, fibroadipose connective tissue. This confers very high tensile strength to these structures. The second important thing to recognize is that uh, most of the tendon tears that we're going to see are really occur near the sites where tendons insert on bone. And uh, tendons insert on bone through a fibrocartilaginous, a vascular zone, uh, going onto the, onto the bone surface. And typically, we see these tendons insert onto bone next to a very convex surface, uh, usually consisting of bone or uh, articular cartilage or, or soft tissue. And this uh, has the property of redistributing the, uh, the stress uh, load on the tendon, uh, actually producing a property known as stress shielding, where, whereby uh, the tensile load on the tendon is actually reduced by compressive forces uh, along these convex surfaces. So that can be predictive to some extent, but it also can produce tendon damage, as we'll, as we'll talk about in a few minutes, by uh, continuous repetitive loads. So we spoke about tendons being very strong structures, and as a result of that, a t it's extremely uncommon to have a rupture of a tendon in a otherwise normal tendon. We do see it occasionally in traumatic incidences, but it's very rare. We generally see tendon tears in the setting of tendinopathy as opposed to tendonitis, which is more of a misnomer. Uh, but the, this is the major cause of tears. It's really a degener degenerative phenomenon rather than an inflammatory one, and these are generally seen in the setting of overuse injury due to repetitive tensile and compressive loads on the tendons as well as the eccentric load distributions. So what happens when a, when a tendon becomes tendonotic? Well, you go from this type of scenario, which is a highly organized distribution of collagen and tenocytes, to something more like this, where there's degeneration and dropout, a disorganization of the collagen, there's increased ground substance, uh, there's increased calcification, uh, tendon cell de tenocyte death due to apoptosis, uh, as well as chondroid metaplasia, with little or no inflammatory uh, cells ever seen in, in this setting. There are a number of predisposing factors associated with, uh, with tendon degeneration. Uh, as we get older, unfortunately, we lose collagen. We have collagen depletion, we have cellular apoptosis, and we have diminished blood flow, so it's harder to get older, as we all know. Uh, in, in addition, genetically, there is an upregulation of uh, matrix metalloproteinases, which is, are a form of coll collagenase that breaks down the collagen in our tendons. And, uh, as, and unfortunately, many tendons also have inherent critical zone or hypovascular zone within them that, that adds to that complexity. When we're losing blood flow, those, uh, those critical zones, in fact, increase with, in size. And of course, for those among us who are, are smokers or, uh, or in patients who are obese, uh, th those, are, those, are, those are predisposing factors as well. And concomitant drug uses, uh, I've, I've had a number of patients who are on the floor clinic loans uh, who have uh, ultimately gone on to develop ten tendinosis and tendon rupture. So these are all things that we need to be aware of. Well, how do we scan tendons? Well, generally speaking, uh, these are linear superficial structures. We're going to approach them similar to other superficial structures. Uh, we're going to use a high-frequency transducer, and of course, that, will, that frequency will depend on uh, both anatomic location as well as depth and body habitus. Proper positioning of, a, of an extremity can, can be very useful in order to improve acoustic access. So this would be, for instance, a crest position in the, uh, in the shoulder if we're looking for the supraspinatus tendon, but this is true regardless of where we're looking. And of course, provocative maneuvers are always very helpful to help accentuate the tendon pathology and, and something we can use to our advantage. And we'll talk about that more in a few minutes.
So what does a normal tendon look like? Well, regardless of where you are in the musculoskeletal system, tendons, uh, because of that uh, arrangement of extracellular collagen, will have this sort of very echogenic fibular look, so this uh, appearance. So this is the flexor pollicis longus tendon in the thumb. This is the Achilles tendon in the back of the heel. So they're echogenic, they're fibular. They display a property known as anisotropy that we'll talk about in a few moments. And of course, they may be surrounded by either synovial line sheath or fibroadipose uh, connective tissue. So what do I mean by anisotropy? Well, if you look at this little inset over here, if the beam is perpendicular to the long axis of the tendon, we get maximum backscatter off the tendon, so the tendon will appear bright. Alternatively, if you, again, if you're coming in on an angle relative to, the, relative to the tendon long axis, and that could be as little as five degrees, the tendon becomes progressively hypochoic. This becomes particularly important when we're looking at tendons going around curved structures or curvilinear surfaces, such as the, and the rotator cuff is one good example of that. So when the beam is perpendicular here, you notice the central portion of the tendon appears more echogenic, and in order to see the more distal portion of the tendon, I need to rock my transducer in order to insinate more perpendicular to the, to the fiber orientation. Now, why is this important? Well, tendinosis typically appears either hypochoic or heterogeneous on ultrasound. We lose that fibrillar architecture, so we don't want to artifactually do that by scanning incorrectly. The tendon may appear at large. There may be indistinct margins, cystic generation, abnormal calcification or ossification, and we may, say, we may see infiltration of abnormal vascularity in the form of angiofibroblastic proliferation, which is really just a fancy way of saying granulation tissue invests the tendon. So this is a typical example of what this would look like. This is an Achilles tendon, which is diffusely enlarged, inhomogeneous with areas where there's complete loss of that normal fibrillar architecture that we spoke about before. This is independent of where we're looking in the musculoskeletal system. So this is, would be in the rotator cuff, and this would be the example in the common flexor tendon of the elbow, where you actually see a little bit of dystrophic calcification. Now this calcification could be punctate or it could be more extensive. So this is an example of another patient with a bad Achilles tendinosa, but look at all the diffuse calcification that we see in both long and short axis here. It's really quite extensive. Vascularity is another feature that we need to be aware of, and that is usually indicative of, of, of that granulation tissue we spoke about. And it could be quite extensive sometimes. And the important thing to realize is in a normal tendon, there's very little or no vascularity that we see uh, on color flow imaging. So anything of this order is clearly very much, a, is very abnormal. So it's something we, should, we could keep track of. Now having spoken about tendinosis, let's start talking about tears. Well, if ideally the primary sign of the C of a tear would be in this the diffusely abnormal tendon, you see a discreetly marginated hypochoic abnormality. Well, unfortunately, life is not always that easy, and, there, and in those situations, we have to rely on a number of secondary signs which can help us identify a tear in, in certain situations. Uh, and of course, when you do see a tear, the important things to be aware of and the things you should report about are where the tear are lo is located, uh, the extent of the tear, and, and, give, and to give its dimensions. So here we have a tendinotic Achilles tendon in which we see a discreetly marginated hypochoic defect entirely within the substance of the tendon. So this is an example of an intrasubstance tear that we see here. This is a high-grade partial thickness tear along the deep surface of the Achilles tendon here in a diffusely tendinotic tendon in the so-called critical zone where there's diminished vascularity. So this is a typical place where we would look for partial thickness tearing in, in an Achilles tendon, for instance. Now, when you have a complete tear, you expect to have retraction of the torn ends. And what we see really depends on whether or not the tendon is, an intact, is situated with an intact peritoneum or, or tendon sheath. So in this case, we have a complete tear. We have retraction of the two ends, but the peritoneum is intact. And we can still see this hypochoic column of soft tissue or fluid corresponding to uh, organizing hematoma or seroma within the intact uh, peritoneum. Alternatively, when we have disruption of that containing structure, you expect to see herniation of the adjacent soft tissue into the defect. So here's another complete rupture of an Achilles tendon, actually from an anthesophyte that we can see retracted proximally. And we see hypochoic uh, fluid over here, but we see herniation of the fat, the, 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 super, uh, the retrocarcanal fat uh, into that defect uh, form where the tendon used to be. 
Now, we may not always be able to identify where the torn tendon is, and one of the things that we can use to our advantage is, is this refraction artifact. Uh, typically, because the acoustic properties of the tendon are significantly adjacent to the, to the soft tissue, whether it be seroma or muscle, you notice that, it, uh, as in this case of this hamstring tendon rupture, you have this dense uh, refractile shadow on either side, and that can really tell you exactly where the tendon is situated. So we can use this sometimes for, uh, as a very helpful feature that when, we, when we're scanning and we're not sure if we're seeing the tendon and well. Again, dynamic scanning, and what I mean by that is performance of provocative maneuvers can be very helpful. So if you look at this Achilles tendon, it's diffusely abnormal, but you'd be hard pressed to say exactly where the tear is or how extensive it is. But when we use a simply plantar flexion of this tendon, you can actually see this is distal, this is proximal, and you can see this gap opening up and the proximal portion is not moving at all, so you can actually see that this is actually a complete rupture of the tear where the tendon uh, torn ends are really in close opposition to one another, and the dynamic maneuver can be very helpful in terms of identifying that. Now, tendon tears also occur at the site of weakness. So we remember tendons are very strong structures. So if you're dealing with a child, it, uh, and this was an example of a, of a high-level uh, gymnast who, finished, who had acute onset of pain in the retrocanal area during a floor exercise, it may not be the tendon itself that ruptures, but in a child in particular, the weak point is, in fact, the growth plate. And in this case, you can see the tendon pretty much is intact, attached to the bone, but the, the apophysis is actually ruptured off, and, uh, and there's really a fracture through the growth plate over here, and that's really the site of where the, where the rupture occurred. Now, tendon tears may also be filled with complex soft tissue, granulation tissue, scar tissue, and it can be sometimes difficult to, to see them well. In some cases, we have a, a, a secondary signs that help us, particularly in the rotator cuff. This so-called cartilage interface can be very helpful, where you have a, a complex of uh, fluid granulation tissue filling the defect, almost making it look like a, an intact tendon. But you notice the conspicuity of the articular cartilage is significantly increased in this situation due to the difference in acoustic attenuation between the normal tendon and the complex fluid, so it increases the reflectivity, and that can be very helpful, particularly if you're looking in the shoulder. The distribution of uh, the tear distribution, or where to look at the tendon, to some extent depends on the activity, so where the forces are located, uh, as well as anatomic factors, whether there be hypovascular zones or whether the, the, the anatomy of the tendon itself, whether it be a simple single tendon or multiple tendons that are conjoined. So this would be an example of a jumper's knee, which uh, tends where the force concentration tends to be along the inferior pole of the patella, along the deep medial surface. So here we have that. We see that in, in this MR as well as in the ultrasound. In tennis players, it tends to be a chronic supination and hyperextension injury, which tends to cause compressive forces along the lateral epicondyle. So we see the sort of typical distribution of uh, tendon tears along the deep fibers of one tendon in particular, the extensor carpi radialis brevis. Tears that occur along, uh, uh, that extend along bony eminences, uh, usually due to pressure, uh, pressure along those bony eminences, uh, an example of that would be typical of the patients who have, uh, in, this, uh, in the foot and ankle. So this patient has uh, pain along the medial aspect of the ankle. You see this is the posterior T-bell tendon with a T2 bright linear area with, uh, within the tendon. The corresponding ultrasound we see over here is this hypochoic defect. And this is typical of what we see in these uh, types of tendons, typically appearing as, uh, as uh, linear split tears. Same thing we see in the lateral aspect of the ankle, usually due to pressure from the peroneus longus as it sits on the peroneus brevis along the lateral malleolus. You have this typical appearance where the pressure effects of the peroneus longus along the peroneus brevis tendon against this hard bony surface cause a central split, and you'll see displacement of the two ends of the peroneus brevis uh, with the usually central herniation of the peroneus longus. Now finally, we we'll talk about shoulder as an example of complex anatomy, and this is probably one of the more complex, uh, one of the most common uh, ultrasounds we were asked to do, and I'm sure it's true in, at Wash U where Bill is, and we know it's a common source of pain affecting as much as 40% of the population, but the anatomy is really quite complex. It's really multi-layered. So let's talk, take a look at that briefly. Well, there are actually five layers that constitute the rotator cuff. There's a superficial layer, is a superficial extension of the corcohumeral ligament, then we have the supra and infraspinatus tendons adjacent to one another. Then we have a deeper layer corresponding to the so-called rotator, uh, rotator cable, which is really the inferior extension of the corcohumeral ligament. And then we have the 
joint capsule. So it's not as simple as we would think. And then in addition, that both the super and infraspinatus tendons are bilaminar structures. So there's actually a bursal and articular laminar associated with that. So we see this reflected in the types of tears we see. So in partial thickness tears, we can have either the articular bursal laminar affected, or we can have actually a delaminating tear occurring between those two structures. And when we see full thickness tears, they can either involve portions of a tendon, complete the involvement of a tendon, or, or well as being massive. So let's take a look at a few examples to finish off. So this would be an example of a high-grade partial thickness tear involving the articular lamina uh, of this patient, uh, an entirely delaminating tear between both the superficial and deep lamina in this particular patient, where you can see the high signal area going through the tendon here, as well as the corresponding low hypochoic area within this, uh, between the bursal and articular lamina in the supraspinatus tendon. And of course, this is an example of a full thickness tear involving the supraspinatus tendon over the, uh, over the uh, anterior facet, uh, superior facet involving the full tendon and uh, going full thickness all the way to the bursal surface. So a few take home points, what to look for. Remember tendinosis appears as a hypochoic or heterogeneous abnormality. You lose the fibrillar architecture, you may see calcification or that angiofibroblastic response. When we're looking for tears, it usually ideally appears as a discrete hypochoic defect within the tendon, but there are secondary signs that we can use to take advantage of to help us identify the tendon if it's not quite clear exactly where the tendon is located. Perform, think, uh, you, it, ultrasound is dynamic. You should always perform uh, provocative maneuvers in order to enhance the appearance of the tendon. And remember, tendon tears often occurs in fairly predictable patterns. Thank you very much.